So I'm going to reiterate this. You know, I've learned something. I have this idea that it would be a good idea for young people and, and older people, citizens of the West, let's say, to learn more about their culture and their civilization, right? Because it's a great civilization and it's, it's, it's taken a lot of work to put together. But I don't think that we really know. I mean, I know a fair bit about it, although I wouldn't consider myself nearly as educated as a person should be, but I'm not too badly educated. And, but I tell you, going through these biblical lectures, verse by verse, just makes me even more aware of how unbelievably ignorant I am. You know, and partly for two, two reasons. Like one is because I've been using this biblehub.com place, and I think I told you last week, but I wanted to reiterate it because it's important. It's so interesting the way that they've set it up because you can go through the biblical stories verse by verse, and then for each verse there's a whole small font page of commentary from multiple sources. And so, you know, not only is the Bible hyper hyperlinked in the way that I discussed in the first lecture with all the verses referring to not all the other verses, but lots of them, but it's, un it's got its tendrils out into literature, you know, direct commentaries on the text, but also all the, all the literature that's been influenced by it. So it's, it's, it's an unbelievably central and core text. And it's so interesting to read a book where every sentence has been commented on, well, really in volumes. And then just to get a sense of that volume of material, you know, how much power, brain power, there's been put into this. And, and to also understand how bloody ignorant, like I'm so ignorant about this. There's all this work and, and it seems that we've left it to decay in the dust. And it's a big mistake, man. It's a big mistake because the people who are writing these commentaries, like, you know, a lot of it's from the 14th and 15th and 16th century. It's kind of archaic and it's, and it's, some of it's outdated and some of it you wouldn't agree with. But if you read all the commentaries side by side, you know, you get a pretty good blast of wisdom coming at you. And like the thing about wisdom is it stops you from running face first into walls, you know? It's not just there to, to, so that you can talk to people at parties about what university you graduated from, you know? And it, it's there because the, the information is unbelievably useful. You know, one of the things that I've realized that I want to return to tonight is I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the Ark, you know, and I, I think I mentioned to you last week that I'd figured out that the, there was this idea that Noah was perfect in his generations, and that meant that he had set his family in order. It wasn't just him, but he had set his family in order. And because of that, when, when the catastrophe came, like it comes to everyone, he was able to withstand it because he had the support of the people who were near and dear to him. And, that's really important when things come along to lay you low. Like, if you're alone and, and the flood comes, it's like, man, goodbye to you. If you've got 10 or 15 people supporting you in a tight network, you know, and, and your, your interrelationships with them are pristine and you can tell them the truth and they can tell the truth back to you, it's possible that you might be able to find that thin way that will preserve you when, 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 when you know, the terrible things come knocking at your door. And so, there's this, the idea of the ark is very, very concrete in Noah. It's actually a structure that, that he inhabits. You know, it's a concretized, almost like a child's story. And, and I'm not being cynical about that because there are some bloody brilliant child's, children's stories. But, you know, it's really concretized. But then Abraham comes along and instead of an ark, there's a covenant, right? Now, it says in the story of Noah that Noah walked with God. And, and of course, Abraham... It isn't clear exactly that he's walking with God or before God, which we'll get into later, but you see, I see this as part of the increasing psycho psychologization of the sacred ideas that were acted out by archaic people. So, first of all, it's concretized in the form of a, a ship that actually sustains you when the floods come, right? It's, it's very concrete imagery, the sort of thing you might see in a movie. But then with Abraham, it turns into a psychological covenant in some sense. It's like a contractual agreement. Now, it's a, con it's a contractual agreement between Abraham and God, but, but that doesn't really matter. That, I mean, obviously it matters, but it's, that, it's, it's, only, it's only half of what's important about that. The other half is that it's a contract. And, you know, one of the things that you do with your ideal, let's say, is you establish a contract with it. And you also establish like a social contract with other people, right? That, that's what keeps society organized. And so there's this idea that emerges in the Abraham stories of a sacred contract. 
and that has the same function as the ark. And what it does, because what happens in Abraham, we'll see more of this today, is that he, you know, God tells him to go forward into the world, and we've, we talked about that last week, and he does that, he encounters famine, and he encounters tyranny, and he encounters powerful people who want to take from him what is his. I mean, God sends him out in the world, but it's not like he has an easy ride of it. It isn't easy at all. It's as hard as it can be. But there's this consistent emphasis in the text, and I think it's something really worth attending to, that if you maintain your contract, which and that has, that has to do with honesty and trust and truth and all of those things, if you maintain your contract, then you have a good possibility, the best possible possibility of making your way through the catastrophe and the chaos. And I, I don't want to be naive about this. You know, when I read Jung and I started to understand the idea of the hero archetype, you know, the idea that the human being is a is a force, a logos force that can stand up against chaos and catastrophe and tragedy and evil and prevail. I never did think that that meant that if you did stand up and, and tell the truth that you would necessarily prevail, right? It's not, it's, not, it's not a magic trick. It's your best bet. That's the thing. You don't have a better option. And so, and that's what's, that's what, that, see the idea is emerging in, in the Abrahamic text. It's like people are figuring this out. That would be progressive revelation. That's one way of thinking about it. And you can think about that in religious terms, but you can also think about it as humanity consulting itself, right? Each individual talking to themselves, which is what we do when we, when we think, and each individual communicating with every other individual and gathering a, a body of wisdom that helps people or orient themselves in the toughest conditions. And, it, it's an incremental process, and I think that, I really do believe that that's, speaking purely secularly, I do believe that that's what manifests itself in the biblical stories, right? It's the dawning enlightenment of mankind, something like that, as we start to understand the principles by which we have to live in order to orient ourselves properly in the world. So, and I also do believe, and, and this, is, this is the thing that's the unspoken question, is like, you don't, you don't have any idea how rich and fulfilling your life could be despite its tragedy and limitation if you stop doing the things that you know to be wrong. It's a really grand experiment. And, you know, one of the things that God tells Abraham constantly as, as the story progresses, especially every time Abraham makes a sacrifice, is God says, walk with me and be perfect. It's something like that. And, and so the injunction is, well, aim high, establish this relationship with the highest thing that you can conceive of, which you might as well do that because, well, what are you going to do? Establish a relationship with the most mediocre thing you can conceive of? Or are you going to establish a relationship with the lowest thing you can conceive of? People do that. And I wouldn't recommend it. It's a really bad thing. And there's a lot of pain associated with that. And maybe, you know, there's, the, there's pain that can expand into a world-destroying force down that route, and there's absolutely no doubt about that. So, what is there something superstitious and foolish about attempting to establish a contractual relationship with the source of all being? I mean, I, 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 I just don't see that as, a, as an erroneous conception. And, you know, it's not necessary, perhaps, to get lost in the details. We can argue forever about what God might or might not be, but we could at least say that the concept of God is an embodiment of humanity's highest ideal, right? We could at least agree on that. And then you might say, well, is that real? And the first thing I would say about that is, ah, there's a lot of things about the world we don't understand. And the second thing I would say is, it depends bloody well on what you mean by real, that's for sure. And that turns out to be a very complicated question.